Hi, Charlie. Thanks for having me on the show. First off, I, I really want to thank you for what you do. I love the podcasts. Right now, there's so much glorification of this plant going on with little thoughts to the side effects, which might be present for a good portion of the people that get stuck in that routine of taking it over and over again. Making these stories heard is equally as important as those that might see positive effects. There needs to be an equal representation of what's going on with the vending of this plant regarding to regulations or standards beyond even what these Kratom consumers protections might require. It's important to note that when I discuss the pharmacology and risks associated with Kratom, I'm speaking about the plant and its active compounds in a general sense, the chemicals themselves. Beginning with a little history and use, Kratom has been used historically for several hundred years by field laborers in Indonesia, Thailand, and other Southeast Asian countries. They would chew the leaf of the tree to increase stamina, working out in the hot sun. And I see many vendors online claim that there's been millennia of safe consumption. However, there's just not enough evidence really to be able to support that in any way. Uh, there, centuries, yes. Millennia, nah, I can't really say that that's, you know, we don't have that hard evidence to, to say that there has been consumed for millennia. It's a tropical tree and scientifically known as Mitragena speciosa. And uh, I might be butchering that name, but I, I've heard it pronounced several ways. I think it rolls off the tongue easier saying it Mitragena speciosa, especially when you get into its metabolites and its active ingredients, you'll see in a moment. Its leaves contain compounds that interact with the human body in some pretty interesting, complex, but uh, also a little concerning ways. So let's dive into the pharmacology just a little bit. Kratom leaves naturally contain two primary active alkaloids, among others. And these are metragenine 1 and 7 hydroxy metragenine 2. Metragenine is an indole based alkaloid and it's the most abundant compound found in the kratom leaves. Metragenine acts as a partial agonist with low to medium affinity for the mu opioid receptor and also interacts with other systems such as adrenergic, serotonergic, and dopaminergic receptors. 7 hydroxy metragenine as the name would imply, as a natural and secondary biologic metabolite of metragenine in its oxidative form. The human body produces this compound through interactions at what are known as CYP enzymes. These CYP enzymes are crucial to the metabolization of drugs and chemicals. So CYPs are very crucial to the breakdown of most chemicals. The specific location where metragenine is converted to its hydroxylated form, which is this 7-hydroxy metragenine, is at CYP3A4. The 7-hydroxy form is considered to be significantly more potent and has much higher affinity for the mu opioid receptor. Strict limits are placed on this compound in regards to sales of Kratom products due to the thought that addiction might arise. Generally, levels are cut off somewhere around 2%, 1%, depending on the state and, of course, depending on which Kratom Consumer Protection Act you're under or if it actually protects you at all. That's another story altogether. These alkaloids interact with the opioid receptors in the brain but they do so in a unique way compared to traditional opioids like morphine. They act closest to what we would see from things maybe like atypical opioids like tramadol. While they do produce opioid effects such as pain relief, euphoria, and of course addiction, they also interact with other neurotransmitter systems, which is why the side effect profile and dependency potential may be different from what we normally see in conventional opioids. Consequently, this also may lead to difficulties in withdrawal during you know, quitting long-term consumption. Just the way that it attaches to different receptors and activates those as well. When, you know, for years you keep doing this, it's acting like an SSRI and you're going to have withdrawal effects, not only from the opioid portion of it, but also from the secondary effects and the secondary targets that Kratom has. And that's why people see these really extended withdrawal times with, you know, not so normal withdrawal effects in terms of what we normally see with withdrawal. They'll have more intense things going on than we would normally see in a standard opioid withdrawal. And I believe that to be more related to the other things that Kratom is doing that we're not very conscious of when we're consuming Kratom. It's crucial to understand that Kratom is not a ubiquitous solution. The effects and consequently safety can vary based on the cultivar, the dosage, and the individual physiology. Lower doses generally produce some sort of stimulating effect where higher doses lean towards sedation and pain relief. However, these effects are not linear and they can vary widely among different people. These, and this is due to 
a number of different reasons, genetic factors, age, health condition, ethnicity, and environmental factors, and really kind of boiled back down to that SIP 3A4, but we'll get back to that. And so let's, let's move on to more of the elephant in the room here, and that would be the safety and regulation. As it stands, Kratom is largely unregulated. Even, I mean, even places that have KCPA, the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, Florida, it's still unregulated. This means the quality can vary significantly from one vendor to the next. There have been reports of contaminated and adulterated products, which this poses a pretty significant risk to consumers, and that's all part of it being unregulated. However, we should take note here that the adulterated products are their own separate category of issues to address, and that's not one that we'll be addressing here. I don't believe, I'm not speaking about anybody adulterating products, so that's a separate issue. Moreover, uh, while some people claim to have positive experience using Kratom for pain management and opioid withdrawal, there are also numerous reports of adverse effects. These can range from mild symptoms like nausea and constipation to more severe issues like addiction, you know, seizures, that's a big one, organ dysfunction, liver toxicity, cardiotoxicity. It's also worth noting that Kratom interacts with other medications, particularly those that affect the central nervous system and are metabolized through that mythical CYP3A. This can lead to dangerous interactions, and it should be a point of concern for anybody that's considering using Kratom. I feel this area doesn't really get enough recognition. There's numerous reports of Kratom interfering with drugs that use this pathway, including but not limited to many opioids, antipsychotics, Seroquel is a big one. Kratom-related deaths are routinely suggested to be due to concurrent intake with other medications, and while this is true, I still believe the onus lies on Kratom. Would these people have experienced these wild adverse effects from their normal pharmaceutical drugs in the absence of Kratom? Now let's take a look into one way a manufacturer may attempt to artificially increase levels of some of these metabolites in Kratom products to produce either a more effective or maybe a more addictive product, while they can still claim their product is even natural. Earlier, I spoke about the two main components of Kratom being metragenine and 7 hydroxymetragenine and this is true. However, since 2016, Kratom members have received a much increased level of attention in regards to medical, toxicological, and pharmacokinetic research. There is now a third metabolite product, which is thought to increase the opioid effects of Kratom consumption. This overlooked metabolite is known as metragenine pseudoendoxyl. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Metragenine pseudoendoxyl is an extremely potent metabolite and that it originates from 7-hydroxymetragenine itself being a byproduct of metragenine. So you can see how we're stepping down here. You've got metragenine and then you've got 7-hydroxymetragenine. And now we're looking at metragenine pseudoendoxyl as the next product. When taken orally, this compound demonstrates remarkably strong affinity for opioid. Studies in mice have shown that metragenine pseudoendoxyl is somewhere between 20 and 35 times the potency of morphine. And given these findings, I think it's clear that this compound has significantly greater ability to activate these specific receptors involved in opioid consumption. While this compound is naturally produced during the metabolism of metragenine in human plasma, its levels can actually be artificially elevated under certain conditions. Many manufacturers seem to continually seek out ways to make their products stronger. One way of artificially causing this is by increasing the levels of metragenine pseudoendoxyl simply by way of fermentation. It's known that fermentation of kratom increases the levels of this chemical, and believe it or not, this has been known since the 1970s. As some manufacturers call this chocolate kratom, and users report more of a painkiller-like effect, likely indicating more activation of those opioid receptors in these users. It's worrying that manufacturers may capitalize on this, either knowingly or unknowingly. They're essentially creating a far more addictive product when they look to increase these levels of this chemical. One of, if not the largest issue in regards to this compound currently, is that there are no standardized lab tests which would quantitatively say levels of this metragenine pseudoendoxyl. Gas chromatography can check these levels. However, at right now, there's no commercial laboratory that tests for pseudoendoxyl. So while Kratom has a reasonably long history and some promising potential benefits, especially medically, on the drug side, that there are some scaffolding there with the metragenine and its metabolite forms that can be probably pretty useful. The, the metabolites of metragenine are far more likely to recruit G protein instead of B arrestin when they're activated, when, when your opioid receptors are activated. So it's less addictive. 
And that's, I put less in quotation marks there because less is quite uh, relative there. It's essential to approach this with all caution as we continue to uh, uncover more. The lack of regulation and standardization makes it much of a Wild West scenario where consumers are required to be their own best medical advocates. Considering the fact that many vendors are moving towards a more predatory style of sales and advertising, misinformation and misdirection abound. If you're considering trying Kratom, please don't. If you're on Kratom and wish to quit, see the links that Charlie provides here or talk to your primary care doctor because they can use Google Scholar as well to figure out what's going on if they don't know. I suggest we no longer contribute to the bank accounts of big businesses hell-bent on taking every last cent from their customers. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for giving me the platform to discuss this little topic regarding the uh, complex and often misunderstood plant. I hope this provides a view that helps your listeners. (laughs) 